Okay, great. So as many of you know, I'm, I'm Chelsea Sparty. We're here and have the great joy of um, hosting the co-directors of Radium Girls. This event is put on by the Samuel Lawrence Foundation in partnership with the creators of the film and the Coalition for Nuclear Safety as well. As an incentive to stick around for the full 45 minutes, our time together includes a chance for two participants to win t-shirts from our favorite outdoor retailer, Patagonia. So stay tuned for that announcement. We'll be also recording this video so you can watch it at a later time. We're thrilled to be joined by the award-winning co-directors of Radium Girls, Lydia Dean Pilcher and Jenny Moeller. Their film, Radium Girls, tells the true story of female factory workers in the 1920s who were poisoned after painting watch dials with irradiated paint. It played at the Tribeca Film Festival, is a recipient of the prestigious Alfred P. Sloan Foundation grant, and is a science on screen partner. The film is especially relevant today, 100 years later, as radiation exposure from nuclear waste and discharges from nuclear power plants continue to endanger our health and environment. If you haven't seen the movie yet, be sure to check the chat for a link to purchase tickets. Radium Girls will be available through January 14th and a ticket costs $12 for an online screening link and it's good for 48 hours. It sends $2 right back to the Samuel Lawrence Foundation. So stay tuned for that. It's impossible to share the full breadth and depth of the work of these directors, but I'll give it a try. Uh, Lydia Dean Pilcher is an American film and television director and producer and founder of Cine Mosaic. She began her career directing documentaries and in 2018, she co-directed Radium Girls. She's a two-time Emmy award winner and Oscar nominated producer of over 40 feature films. And she has worked with many fellow acclaimed directors over the years. Ginny Moeller is a Brooklyn based writer, director and researcher. Her background as an archival researcher for documentary television laid the groundwork for her passion for hidden history. Her work centers on the untold stories of women who speak truth to power. She's been an artist in residence at the Virginia Center for Creative Arts, Moulin Anef in France, and the studios at Mass Mocha. Thanks for joining us today, Lydia and Jenny. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. So, so let's jump right in. Tell us how this project came to be. Back in 2012, I was working at a documentary company doing archival research on a two hour special for the Discovery Channel about the Manhattan Project. It was not a subject I was familiar with at all, but it really went from like zero, zero to 60 really fast in terms of all, all of the research that I could find. And in one of the books, um, General Leslie Groves' memoir about, about the Manhattan Project called Now It Can Be Told, he was talking about health insurance for the project workers. And he said, in considering it, we all remember the tragic dial painters of World War I. And I just, it was a sort of hard stop for me. And I reread it and I didn't know what a dial painter was. And I was not familiar with the tragedy he was talking about. And I couldn't imagine actually, given the context, I just had no idea. And so I, I looked, th looked it up and found the Wikipedia page called the Radium Girls. And I was working alongside my screenwriting partner and an old friend from college, Brittany Shaw. And we read the story, we couldn't believe it. We were moved by so much of it and, and the tragedy and the, the sort of teenage dreams you know, deferred and um, and that's when we decided to to start writing a screenplay, adapting it. Yeah, and I'll just add to that that um, I've been an environmental activist for many years, and I was looking for a project that would really marry my storytelling career with my um, passion for the environment. And when I read uh, Jenny and Brittany's screenplay, I was very moved by the idea that the story was told through the eyes of teenage girls. So there was this age of innocence and then kind of, you know, one of the most, you know, sort of disturbing rude awakenings one could imagine in your lifetime 
um, working at the radium factory, but they were, you know, they were dreamers. They were part of a very vital world that was politically turbulent, even though that wasn't something they knew about. They, they knew that King's Tut tomb had been founded and they had a fascination for the, for the Book of the Dead. And um, it was the jazz age. And there was a lot of other things going on that they were, they were interested in. But I think that, you know, the idea of radium as, as being sort of this, you know, central, you know, inciting event and in the story is also interesting because it was in a time when radium had just been discovered and people thought it was um, a miracle elixir. It had been sort of reducing tumors and there were some healthful effects, but the profiteers just kind of went crazy about, you know, it's going to put a glow in your cheeks and drink the water. And um, it was, you know, it was the discovery of the element had happened, but the scientific discovery of what it all meant hadn't yet been realized. So I think, you know, when, when we released the film in October, which, you know, was a little bit later than we had planned, we thought we were going to release in April and then the theaters were shuttered. It was interesting how many parallels to COVID that the, that the journalists and the press picked up on. And it, um, we feel like the timing actually was, has been in our favor, um, even though we didn't plan it this way, because there, um, there are a lot of parallels between, you know, the idea of, you know, um, an, something that we COVID, something that we don't know everything about, um, you know, people are getting sick, they're dying, is it safe to go back to work, the, you know, science is being denied, government's looking the other way. Um, it, it brings a lot of, it brings a lot of things into focus in terms of the questions that I think, you know, people like us and who are involved on this call are really trying to figure out how to address in our culture and our society. Absolutely. So we hear a little, a little bit of your inspiration for making the film there. What were some of your hopes um, of this film, uh, knowing that we're, we're facing these, these big issues? Mm -hmm. Well, there were hopes early on, always, from the beginning of, of outlining the film and saying, you know, whose lens is this from? To, for Brittany and I, it was, it was always you know, it was about the the sisters, um, the women, and not portraying them as victims, but as as like as the heroines of this experience. Um, and so, th in that, one of the things that I, I was always so excited about was, you know, just reaching young, reaching students, uh, young people. I I you know I wanted to make a movie that. I would have seen in seventh grade science class the day a substitute teacher came and <laughs> showed us a movie that um, that would then kind of like stay with me and rattle, like kind of just stay, which the story did for me. And um, that that was always a, a long term, big picture hope is just to inspire people to look further. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, and I think um, I mean, one of the things that really interests me about the story too is the role that the early women's political movement played in kind of uplifting the Radium Girls story. I think that that's something that particularly in this, in the moment that we're in right now where we just really saw like every vote matters, every voice counts and how important it, it is, you know, for everybody to come together and use that voice. Um, that, that part of the story with the Radium Girls really inspires me because the story took place in a time when women had just gotten the right to vote. And so, and, and everybody was organized and active and they wanted to use the vote and there was no regulation in industry. Um, there, were, there was the Consumers League that was also run by women and was really out in front of, you know, industrial, you know, um, say industrial workplace safety, toxin issues. Um, Alice Hamilton, who was the first female professor at Harvard and was one of the pioneers in industrial toxicology, was um, connected to the head of the New Jersey Consumers League, Catherine Wiley. And it was really that connection once the factory in Orange, New Jersey was, was really, had really revealed 
um, you know, when they exhumed one of the bodies of, of one of the radium workers, who was a sister of, of our two sisters, that proved that the radium, that she died of radium poisoning, not syphilis, <laughs> which, which is what the company was saying. And once that happened, it really provided an entree for other activists to really come in and help, help the radium girls and lift them up and, and use the media machine that they had really honed, you know, during their suffrage work. I find that very interesting too, because I, again, I think that the only way we can tackle all of these issues, you know, in our world today is by, you know, coming together and uniting and really, you know, building that power collectively. Absolutely. We've, we've definitely seen that in our work as well. And the, the necessity of working together and working across all kinds of intersections and, and all kinds of groups. Um, so to Today, we're, we're joined by several students as well from a local high school, Oceanside High School. And one of those students, Laura, is curious, what spoke to you about this story and the subject that, that led you to want to adapt it into a film? So there's so much in the story that is I mean, it's, it's one of those things where I don't think I ever could have described like this is, these are the things that I would be looking for in, in a historical adaptation. And in fact, like at that time, um, I, in my career, I was just a couple years out of film school. I was, not, I didn't even realize how much I loved history or how exciting I thought it was. And, and there's something about this story that as I, as I already, as I, as I already said, and and also what Lydia was saying about the women's political movement and like the teenage girls and this like what happens when your world is turned upside down that was like the driving question like what happens what would happen what would it be like for me what would it be like for Brittany like um as we were making this film what would it be like and then I there's also something very inherently dramatic so I you know I would say that this is this this historical these historical events are almost shaped like greek tragedy like like it was scripted like that where you have the the glow and the decay you know and they're they're and and the the symbolism of of clocks and time and time is running out and the court case it has a timeline and and um and you know the fact that you know what looks like magic turns out to be poison, and then it and then it's just sort of down the rabbit hole from there in terms of not only is it poison, but the people who you would think their job is to protect you knew otherwise and didn't protect you, and it turns out their job is to, um, you know, put profits first. So all of all of that and more, but that was the entry point. Mm. Uh, so another student, Juan, is asking, what type of scientific experts were involved in this process? Did you did you involve them in the production at all? Well, as a a, a Sloan film, we initially wrote the screenplay as we applied for a Sloan Science and Film grant, and they they one of the requirements for that is to have a scientific expert um, advise, which was really helpful, and that was someone we talked to really early on looking, I think, my, if I'm remembering correctly, I, it's specifically at, at like the effects of radium necrosis on, on um, the jaw and on, on a person's body. And then we also had a, his, like, a, I didn't even realize actually then that history of science was a field, um, <laughs> which is an amazing field. And so we had a, a expert in the history of science who continued to advise on the script and he was someone that I had worked with as an expert on that Manhattan Project documentary and his his focus was on the Manhattan Project and then he had a lot of research and connections into the you know the early years of radio radioactivity in America. Great. Uh, the, these students are also looking for their future careers. So it's it's really great to see where filmmaking and science and history all connect. Mm. Uh, so Susan Shapiro is curious, was it difficult to get funding given this subject matter of, of radium and radiation? 
Well, I think that um, I think that just in the sort of the standard sort of storytelling industry, you know, one of the things we had to do was dispel the site. You know, I mean, if you think about it, who wants to go see a movie about a group of teenage girls who get poisoned and die? Like, it's it's just it's not the kind of thing that people are sort of rushing out to see on their Friday night, but what we really tried to do was to approach it from a very um, a very human, you know, from a very human level and to really kind of build the world around the Radium Girls that they existed in so that you could kind of under, you could kind of understand that there was, a, as in our world today, there's always a lot going on, you know, and there was a lot going on for them and, um, and, and happening all around them. But again, it really, it really was, I think ultimately about trying to send um, a message, a message of empowerment, but also this idea that, you know, people are drawn to true stories, you know, and I, I think that, I think that there's a keen interest in true stories because people want to, you know, if it's true, then, you know, you have to sort of take it as truth. And, it, and that actually is something in our favor as activists in terms of telling historical stories, because it happened, you know, it was, there's a beginning, there's a middle, there's an end, it happened, you know, we, we often talk about how people have a hard time understanding things that they can't see. So if you can't see climate change, you can't see radium, you can't see COVID, there, it just leaves a lot of room for misinformation, disinformation, for people to manipulate what is the truth. So I think, you know, for those, for the, for those, you know, those were kind of the things that we tried to push forward. I mean, ultimately, we were able to sort of, you know, appeal to a lot of grant funders who had sort of special interests in the stories and the themes. And then we also um, were very fortunate to find a group of Broadway, female Broadway producers who um, just loved the story and, the, the, and they wanted to just form a pool and support us. And um, that's, that's how we sort of got over the finish line at the end. We're, you know, we are a small film, but um, you know, we were really, we were really lucky to have the support. Lily Tomlin and Jane Wagner were in part of that producing group and um, they've been real champions of the film too. Mm -hmm. So you touched on something that, that we run into a lot, the whole not being able to see the, the harm or the risk and having things be a longer term. Are there any communication strategies that you've learned that you'd, you'd be willing to share and suggest to others who are doing similar work? It's something that we, um, it's something that we talk a lot about. Um, I mean, you know, I mean, I think that, you know, I, I, th I think it's a, it's a, it's a, I, I think referring to other, you know, other issues, other stories is really helpful. I think, you know, I think the Chernobyl miniseries, I, I mean, I think it was really terrific in terms of sort of explaining on a very human level, you know, how, how that kind of disaster could happen. Um, you know, the, the story of big tobacco is another one um, and how many, how many years it's taken to sort of convince people that, you know, that cigarette, smoking cigarettes can cause cancer. Um, but yeah, I think that, you know, it's, it, it, especially right now, one of the things we're doing a campaign with the Sierra Club where we're making some calls to action um, particularly around EPA assessments and gen the gender and toxics initiative that they have. I mean, one of the things we're trying to do is, you know, okay, we're all like, we've all been living in this pandemic for almost, you know, for almost a year pretty soon. And, and we're weary and we're, and, and the ups and the downs of it create a certain amount of anxiety and how much more anxiety can somebody take right now mm -hmm. in terms of these issues that you're really trying to make them aware of. And, I mean, I did the um, climate training program that, that, that Al Gore does in Nashville with his slideshow. And um, that was some, many, many years ago, but it always stuck with me that he said, you know, you've got a hope budget, you know, and you've got a fear budget. You have to sort of give enough fear, but enough hope, because you can't bust in either budget or you'll lose everybody. So I do think that um, one of the things that we're trying to think about in terms of our Sierra Club campaign is to really 
talk to people about, you know, look, we're, we are all anxious about all of this stuff, but you can turn that fear into fuel. You know, you can turn that fear into power and to try to really inspire people to, um, you know, to step forward. I think, I think one of the things the pandemic has, has given us is more time for us all to think about our, our lives and our sense of purpose. So I'm, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that that, you know, is something that we'll be able to, you know, work with and, and, and try to see what we can turn it into. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a, a quick question from Eric, a student at Oceanside High School. He asked, how long did it take to, to make the film? Well, Brittany and I started, I found that I, you know, I've, I, I learned about the story in February of 2012 which I know because I have a very passionate email that I sent to all of my coworkers <laughs> saying, breaking history, you will never believe what happened in 1927. Um, so that's around when we, we started writing the film in 2012. And then it, we applied for that first grant for about, um, it took about a year and a half to the different rounds um, to move through which I will also say the first round, we were informed that we were the wild card in the bunch and kind of an unlikely candidate. So it was really exciting as, as we got further along in that process. So that was, so then um, after, after um, receiving that grant is when um, we connected with Lydia and um, her company Cinema Mosaic and, and spent the next few years developing the film together. Um, and and the financing. Yeah, I think I think sort of to answer the 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 question, probably probably what's really on their mind is it, it you know you you have an idea and you have to create a screenplay and then you know sometimes that screenplay just it goes through a a, a period of gestation because it's it it is essentially an iterative process. You write something. People read it. They give you feedback. You may change it. You may take it in different directions. I think I think it, it's fair to say, you know, the screenplay that Jenny and Brittany were working on, you know, had different directions it could go in. And part of our process was really crystallizing the direction we wanted it to take. Um, so that's just a creative process, and you can't, you know, you can't measure how long that's going to take. When we decided we were ready to make the movie, we, you know, we started to put our department heads together, you know, the, the camera person, the, the production designer, the costume designer, um, and we started to prepare. And that preparation, you know, on any kind of feature film can take um, anywhere from, you know, three to four months, depending on how complicated your mm -hmm. movie is. And then when we actually got ready to shoot and we knew exactly what we were doing, we had already picked all the locations, you know, we, we shot the movie in 21 days. Okay. And then, and then after you shoot the movie, you, you enter in a, to a post-production process, which is not unlike that writing development process sometimes. Um, but um, we, you know, we spent sort of a concert, we could spend sort of concerted chunks of time where we would edit, you know, the movie into a cut, then we would test it out mm -hmm. with different groups of audiences and then go back in. And so, it's um it's really a matter of how quickly you can kind of move through those steps um, as you you know as you sort of shape it and um, decide when it, when you've like maximized its potential. Great. So just a, a a quick break here. We have our first winner of the Patagonia Women's T-shirt, and that is Sarah Moscow. So you've won. Uh, the women's t-shirt and we'll have one other t-shirt at the at the end of the of the conversation as well so congrats Sarah uh, do we get to meet Sarah <laughs> this is a, this is exciting I'm excited because um, <laughs> at, at our New Jersey uh premiere we we were screening at a dry at the Cranford drive-in theater uh -huh. and Jenny and I um raffled off one of the factory um lab coats oh wow <laughs> and so 
so we were we were out there. They, there was like 80 cars socially distanced. You know, they they really did a beautiful job with the screening. But um, before it, I was like, but before it started, I was like, how are we ever going to find the person that has the winning ticket? <laughs> and of course, all they had to do was honk. <laughs> Well, Sarah, Sarah's on the call. Sarah, do you want to say anything? Um, I, this is wonderful. I have never won anything before in my life. And if I'm going to win something, this is a great thing to win. So thank you, guys. You're welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. And we're, we're really grateful to Patagonia. They jumped in and um, have been really active supporters of uh, protecting our coast from radioactive waste here in Southern California. So we're grateful oh, to that their store. Okay. Um, so Ace Hoffman asks, what's the estimated number of girls who became sick from radium poisoning? I don't know that I have not seen a, a hard number, which isn't to say that there is not one out there, but, um, one of the problems was that, you know, women, women were either being misdiagnosed or weren't coming forward. And so I think that, right. um, I, so I think there's that there was a study done at, um, the Argonne National Laboratory, I believe, on former dial painters. And that's where some of like the, the data um, on the disease and like the progression of, of radium poisoning came from. Um, mm-hmm. But in terms of, of actually really understanding the scope of it, I haven't seen a, a number. I think it's in the hundreds, mm-hmm. but it, it's true because things, you know, as with COVID, the intensity of your um, your sickness has a lot to do with the level of exposure that you've had. And I was, I you know, with Catherine Schaub, who was one of the New Jersey Radium Girls, and she's the she's the um, real life person who the Joey King character is based on. Um, she wrote diaries and um, had really left a lot of sort of information about her own personal experience um, behind. But I, I think she died when she was, you know, 30. Um, and it was, it was, um, she, the, the cancer had sort of, it, the can, it, it had gotten into her bones and she, she developed a tumor on one of her legs and they wanted to amputate it and she didn't want to. And I think she died at the age of 30, but she was much younger, you know, when the whole Radium Girls case was happening. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, it, it affected, it, it affected people in so many different ways. I think the radium um, dust would, you know, could, to, even though they were lip pointing and, and that was very severe because it was, you know, you're taking in that radium right into your, your dental cavities and your, this very delicate tissue in your mouth. And, um, but the radium dust could, you know, could be anywhere all over. Right. So something that really stood out for me, the film is a story about women. It's uh, powerful to have it both written, told and directed by a team of women. And um, one of our, the teachers among us, Juan Hernandez asks, what advice would you give to young girls and women who have had to endure an injustice? Well, I think that we're in a really interesting time you know, for, I think for women and for, and for many underrepresented groups in our culture, because we've had this, you know, we're having, first of all, we're having a demographic shift in our, in our country where um, the power, you know, the sort of dominating power culture is, is going to be overtaken by a much more diverse uh, multicultural demographic. And I think the economic power of women has shifted and has um, gotten stronger. And, I think I think a lot about the the systems that are in place that really sort of oppress all of us or throw out barriers and keep us um, keep us from going through doors that we want to go through. But I think that we have to sort of think about a culture that can change and and when there are things that are not just, I think we have to find the groups to talk about them within, we, it, wherever we are, if it's in a workplace or a school, we have to find um, allies and, and we have to sort of build allies. And I think that, I think that pe- women and, and people who 
feel like they have the capability to be leaders can also help create spaces for so that people have spaces to talk about injustice and people can talk about strategies and how to deal with them in their own particular situations. I, I think this ability to, just to even talk about it is something that is only kind of uncorked in the last couple of years. And I, I think it's really, I think it's really significant. You know, it's really significant. Absolutely. So in our work advocating at, uh, for safety at nuclear power plants and with radioactive waste storage, we've seen similar themes of patriarchy and imbalanced power dynamics particularly when utility corporations and the nuclear industry take advantage of the poor with promises of jobs and settlement funds for storing radioactive waste or, or other schemes that they come up with. We are nearly 100 years on from the scenes in the film. And Megan Hayes asks, how do these conditions impact us today as we continue to uncover truth in corrupted industries and shed light on them through film and, and other measures? Well, they're, they're connected to so many issues that we're facing today. And I, you know, when Jenny and I finished the film, we were in touch with some people from the EPA and they told us that they still use the Radium Girls case and when they're litigating toxic chemical um, cases in court. And I was kind of like, it was so long ago. I mean, really, you still use that case? And, and then, you know, you stop and you think about it, that Radium wasn't banned until the 70s. And that was when... The EPA was formed, OSHA was formed, um, and there and the cleanup is massive. It still isn't contained today, but I think I think the EPA and the Superfund sites really got out there and um, you know d dealt with the contaminated groundwater and those kind of things. But like in same issues that you're talking about with nuclear waste, I mean, the 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 waste from the radium factories they just put it into landfills and put it in concrete and poured sidewalks and used it in the foundation of houses. And all of these are things that have had to be, be you know, torn apart in the cleanup. It's, um, it's so pervasive. And some of those buildings are still out there. They're just fenced off properties. You know, they just sort of closed the door and walked away, but they're, they're luminous watch style factories, you know, in many places across the country that, that have sites that are just sitting there. Um, so I think I think that there's a lot of there's a lot of parallel um, to you know there's the the PFAS you know chemicals and the PFOAS chemicals with the firefighter foam and there's a lot of things that really that we really need to take seriously and um, we've been J Jenny and I are in touch with Elizabeth Sutherland who was you know the head of the EPA for 30 years before she decided to leave the Trump administration because she felt she would be more effective outside of the government. And she's, um, we're doing an event with her next week uh, because when she left the EPA, she, she was, became part of a group of 500 scientists called the Environmental Protection Network. Do you, have you, do you know them, Chelsea? I haven't heard of them, no. They, um, there, there are, it's, it's a, I mean, it's a smaller group because it's 500 scientists and they, they are all working, you know, on a volunteer basis, but they have monitored everything that's gone on in the EPA in the Trump years. And Betsy says there's 80 regulations that the EPA needs to put back in place as soon as possible. They won't all go back in at the same, some will go back in, you know, right away. And some will take a year, you know, depending on the steps and the protocols that they have to go through to undo um, the problems that, you know, have been created by the way, by the way Trump's people have um, rolled back these protections. But, you know, they, it, it was it's comforting to me to know that they've got their eye on the ball and that they're really focused on it. They're working with the Biden-Harris transition team now. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, you know, that's I, mean, I think we have to, I think we all just have to stay focused on it all together. Yeah. So Kathy Iwane had a, had a question, um, possibly for you, Jenny, that for her, this, this film really showed the necessity of legal precedent in order to raise public awareness. 
in your archival research, have you come across any lawsuits where the citizens prevailed against a government body or regulator, uh, proving negligence from a poorly managed nuclear plant in the US or, or another site that managed radiation? I haven't, I haven't um, yet, uh, but I also, the majority of my nuclear research really was focused on, or the, sorry, the majority of my research, which focused on on nuclear issues was was primarily um, the Manhattan Project era and then and mm -hmm. then Radium Girls. So, yeah. So earlier on. Earlier, but I will tell a story, which I think connects to um, what, you know, the, the last few questions too. Um, and I just think it's like, it's such an important example because I think legal precedent does go a long way. But then I think also as with, like with the Radium Girls, the press and the public outrage can be mobilized without it and mm -hmm. can drive it often. Um, and uh, I think the case of what, you know, there's a lot of cases of, of industrial toxins in, in the 1920s and the years before and, and also stories of you know, in, incredible activists, most most of them women, who were um, fighting really hard to keep workers, especially like women and children workers, um, safe from these chemicals that were unregulated. And I think the white, what happened with white phosphorus is a really important example um, in that it's, white phosphorus was used in, in making matches and was very poisonous and, and caused fossy jaw and other sim symptoms that were pretty similar to radium poisoning and was often could be fatal and have necrosis. It was, I mean, it was a very gruesome disease and activists, organizers, legislators worked very hard to, to put regulations in place around it. And in, in the early 1910s, I wanna say like maybe 1912, legislation was passed on a federal level to ban white phosphorus from being used in creating matches. So at this point, there is a serious paper trail. It's definitely toxic. Everyone knows it. And yet, because the law calls out match production, it is continued to be used in New Jersey to make fireworks. So at the time that the Radium Girls case is happening, one of the things that the company tries to pin it on is phosphorus poisoning. And they say, well, phosphorus is being used over at the fireworks plant. And so maybe some of the women were contaminated, you know, had something to do with phosphorus. And even some of the early, you know, inspections of the plant of the radium girls factory were looking for phosphorus and when they didn't find phosphorus they said well then it must be fine mm -hmm. because you know maybe it's the phosphorus so i just think that that's a really important example of you know like baby steps and loopholes and really holding companies accountable because there, there's no way that that company could say we had we didn't know like sorry um not with that initial law Long story, but thank you for <laughs> indulging me. Yeah, we, we see this um, pretty frequently. Something that we often hear from the nuclear industry is that you get exposed to X amount of radiation from taking in a, a, a flight. And it's it's such a distracting and, and useless claim uh, to bring that up. And similarly, other groups test uh, radioisotopes in the water that are released from, from nuclear power plants but they're only testing one or two. They're not testing the dozens that are out there and they're not telling you how much of it um, is happening and, and when and where over time. So we have, we have some major gaps in knowledge and I think that your example is still relevant today. Uh, something that really hit home for me, so these women suffered a lot and I'm wondering if you heard of any accounts of how they viewed nuclear power commercialization less than three decades after their, their fight against radium. Maybe some of them didn't even live long enough to see that happen. I haven't. I, yeah. I have, no. yeah. It would have been in the 1950s, 1960s. I, you know, if, I think if, if you're um, really curious about that, I think the best resource in it, the 
answer is not coming to mind, but there's a documentary about um, called Radium City that was made in the 80s about um, the, the town in Illinois where um, there was a radium watch factory and it, a lot of the film deals with the aftermath and, and does interview people who, um, I, they interview one dial painter who was part an inspiration for the, the part of Bessie's story where she, she doesn't like the taste of the brush. And so they interview this former dial painter um, who still has, um, is, is not completely healthy, but, but I think that might be a, have, have some more information about about that sure, the, I, the town was very contaminated as a result. Yeah, I'm sure that a lot of folks will be interested in that. Um, in addition, we have a an expert on the call, the esteemed Dr. Tim Musso, who has done research many years at Chernobyl. And he asks, is there a movie in your future dealing with the fallout of the Chernobyl disaster? I think it would be hard to top the HBO miniseries. Um, written by Craig Mazin. I, I felt that that was very well done in terms of just bringing, bringing you into the world of all the people involved and how many, you know, from all these different angles. Um, I, I, I found it very compelling and very effective. Um, yeah. yeah. I don't know. I don't know if I would tackle that one, but there's, there's plenty of other <laughs> disasters out there. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Okay, so we only have a, a few minutes left. We still have a couple of unanswered questions. Um, uh, one, one of the, the teachers asks, has the film and your research about radium have, have, has it had any influence on how you feel about nuclear energy? Well, I, I, I think that a lot of the things that you mentioned in terms of like, is the, you know, is our, is our world capable of handling nuclear power responsibly? I, I you know, it, it doesn't seem so, you know, <laughs> it, you know, given, given the pull between, you know, regulatory, you know, entities and business interests and, who's really, um, who really the vulnerable populations are that are going to be, you know, exposed to the things that don't work. It just, it just doesn't, it just doesn't seem like, um, it doesn't seem like we're there, that we're ready. So I don't, um, I, I, I think if anything, what the movie has done, you know, in my, in my worldview, because I'm not a scientist and I'm not a, you know, it, i I do live mostly in the world of arts and culture and the history or the events that I sort of dive into for each project. But I think, you know, what it's done for me just personally is, is it has really broadened my whole um, awareness and, and sensitivity to all the, the, the number of dangerous things that are out there that really, we really do need to be paying more attention to. Um, and I think, I think thinking creatively, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that's, partly where Juan's question is coming from, because I can tell he must be, he must be involved in design and art in some way from, mm -hmm. I can tell from the chat. But I, I think that, that that really is our challenge is how do we, um, how do we tell stories that, that can help people think differently about something or to look at something from a different way than they have before to break through, break through the biases that they've had about things that may not be a as close to the truth as what we feel, you know, the truth can be. So I think I think that's our challenge um, as artists, you know, is, is to try to inspire people to see differently or in new ways. I definitely, I, I'm sure that many of us have experienced that from watching your film and are so grateful for, for being able to, to see things in a new way through all of your many years of work. Uh, so we have, uh, before we, we close, we have, the next winner, um, the person who won oh. the Patagonia men's flannel is Deborah Hornstra. So Deborah, I see you're, you're down there. Congratulations. Um, please uh, look to the chat. Amanda will give you some information on how to receive the shirt. Uh, 
again, we're so grateful to have you, Lydia and Jenny here with us. And we're really looking Thank forward you. to sharing your, your film and being able to continue the work that it takes to achieve uh, and safeguard people and the environment from, from radiation. Uh, anything, any final thoughts that you want to share with all of us? Well, I just want to, you know, thank everybody for everything that they're doing. And I think particularly the students that are um, on the chat, you know, we, Jenny and I are aware that there's a Radium Girls play that is out there and is performed widely in high schools and colleges. It's been the in the top 10 high school plays performed in the U.S. in the last three years. And what that says to me is that there is a younger generation that is really interested in talking about these issues and is, is, is not looking the other way. They, they really want to take it head on. I know from being um, a, a teacher in, in a film school in New York myself that a lot of the students in the millennial generation feel like, you know, uh, they didn't break this world, you know, but they're inheriting it. And mm -hmm. I think that, and I think in so many ways, the young people are our future. And the more that we're actually working together, I'm so thrilled that they're on the they're on the Zoom tonight. Um, the stronger we're all going to be. And I, I would just add that conversations like this one tonight are were were the dream for making the film. We're we're part of like the hope, and so it's really exciting, albeit in a completely unexpected type of format for <laughs> Q and A's and conversations. It's, it's really meaningful and, um, and you know, the passion and curiosity and the work of everybody on this call is, is exciting to me. And I, you know, I'm, I, I'm so glad that we get to talk about all of the different, you know, both the historical and the, and the current landscape um, with radiation. So Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We're, we're able to tune in near and far and we really appreciate all that you do. Thanks for joining us. And um, we look forward to seeing what you come up with next. Okay, all right, thank you. Thanks, <laughs> bye.